author, but also the principal of our wonderful school. Today is the inception of the legacy started by the students of HFS International. Ma'am, we're proud to be students of a school whose principal not only knows the importance of morals and values, but also implores us to be better leaders and better citizens of tomorrow. We've all had the opportunity to read your terrific new book, The Path to Leadership. Today, we'd like to present you the stage and ask you our burning questions of it. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to have your own students talking to you because whatever I write or whatever I think, I have no in mind because you are the closest to me where I can impart all my experiences and knowledge. Please do feel free and ask me whatever you want to. Thank you so much, ma'am, and uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, I'm Vidya Dhani, and I am uh, very uh, fortunate to be a part of this panel and uh, to be, you know, be able to pick your mind and uh, your thoughts as part of the author of this book. Uh, my favorite part of the book, honestly, has been the overall aesthetic. Uh, like, the book has been able to inspire connections between things that uh, you know, I had not drawn lines together before. My name is Ma'am, uh, I'm Sasha Bhavro and I'm very fortunate to be part of this panel today and be one of the first to hear uh, your thoughts and get a glimpse of your uh, thought process when writing this book. Uh, my favourite part of the book was its structure and how every chapter you went ahead to define a different quality of leadership and then share your anecdotes which I think really helped me connect. Good morning, ma'am. My name is Iman Sikarwal. Firstly, it's an honor to be a part of this and uh, learn, and I'll get to learn a lot from you as well from this. So, and my favorite part of the book was basically the plethora of references that you use in both the famous personalities or uh, which can be pop culture and antiquity. Looking, more for, looking towards it, ma'am. Thank you. So, ma'am, before we begin, um, let's welcome the woman who really needs no introductions and whose immaculate articulation and intuition has led her to becoming the mentor, leader, and principal that she is to all of us today. Ma'am, first of all, as the foundations of your book highlight the importance of nature, you draw a lot of interrelations between the outer seeming humble persona of nature and the human mind. So my first question to you is, since when did this start? Since when did the inception of you being beguiled by nature actually begin? And how do you advise, in your expert opinion, how do you advise us students to find more time to connect with nature and be surprised and mesmerized by its complexity? Thank you, dear. I must tell you the entire book is based on observation, experience, and then the analysis. Our time when we were kids, we were not as fortunate or maybe more equipped like you are and you virtually go to different places sitting on your couch. We had to move out to observe nature. And we learned a lot from nature. And I am a lover of animals, trees, birds, and rivers because I had the good fortune of traveling right from my childhood. Because of my father's service and after marriage, because of my husband being in the army, so we could explore the country first. And when we did, we as siblings would always question why this has happened. Why did the water look orange when we were on the coastal side? Like some of you belong to Odisha, you all belong to the coastal, right? And they were fine. So then it led to think as oh, so full of minerals. So that is why the water looks. Then comes the next question. You see certain types of birds, you see certain types of uh, uh, animals. So slowly, this helped me to understand that we are being led by nature. Just because they are mute spectators, that doesn't mean we haven't learned enough from them. And so I thought, just, you know, like everybody else, I didn't want, I like to write a book on leadership, no doubt, but I didn't want to start it in the usual manner of saying this is managerial leadership, and this is organizational leadership. I thought if I have to catch your attention to become a leader, I need to take environment into confidence. This was my little tete a with environment that led me to write this. Oh, wow. 
That's really sounds magical. Uh, so technically you can say you were bewildered by wildlife. <laughs> I was, I was. You know, I have gone to most of the uh, games actually. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wow. Absolutely wonderful. I went to South Africa, I think that was one of my best, where I saw the animals, they look as if they had just come out of the boutique. Oh. <laughs> they look so lovely, so beautiful. It's uh, uh, so for our next question, um, in your book you mentioned that anyone can be a leader. And uh, you, you, know, you mentioned that uh, it under the chapter of insights, that a true leader follows their instincts and is quick and smart on their feet. Uh, could you share uh, any such life experience of yours, wherein you had to think fast on your feet, and uh, you know, did it turn out for the better or worse? Yes, I think we all have to be insightful leaders. And the very fact that your episode begins by saying insightful leads, I would love to share a few of my thoughts. And I know that today, if I am sitting here, it's not that it has been a big walk and I have just marched off to the chicken. It was a lot of trials, tribulations, and learning through these super level instincts that I have given in my book, which begins with I. And the reason for having this I is because we connote the word I as being very selfish. But we are human beings. We don't have to be selfish, we have to be self. Isn't it? So I got of the best of this. And coming to insight and leadership, we are not born leaders. We have leadership traits in us. All of us. How do we bring them out? You have to identify. And that is the insight you need to have. Like I've given you any number of examples. If I have to tell you an insight, my leader starts thinking that how does one, you know, and I've used words like cap, edge to make it even simpler. And you, you work on your uh, ideas, you work on your uh, thinking that this is what has led me to become what it is. That's amazingly poignant. Okay, so um, now as students are always striving to be better leaders and writers, and I personally feel that all of us would benefit from knowing what was the hardest part of your writing process and how did you overcome it? Maybe like writer's block or something. Yeah. Yes, and you're very right and a very nice question. Yes, I did have a blog, but then I felt a blog doesn't reach out. You see, as students, as children, when you're reading others writing books, you always have a desire. Why don't I take out a hard copy myself? Now, I just learned, uh, just before you know the show, we were talking to each other, and then I remember Disha telling me that I think you can do an audio book. I said, all that may be there, but there's nothing like the fragrance of the pages of a hard copy book. And that was my desire. It did take quite some time. And yes, I began with the blog. But the blog, of course, is all technology. And so I thought a hard book would be an experience to tell the students of mine, to tell the young youth of mine, that feel it what I have read. Don't perceive it always. Don't just listen. It will always be hard. And this is how I come to write. Book. Yes, there were challenges. It was not very easy to take out the book because one has to be very careful what you write, all right? And your resources have to be correct. And of course, you have to have your own unique style. So I tried to develop that. Oh, that's wonderful, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I hope an audio book is released as well. <laughs> so my question is, you have mentioned franchises like Harry Potter, Jurassic Park, and Star Wars as work of John Williams in the chapter titled Intelligence. So my question is, have there been any franchises or role models like such during the course of your life that ignited the spark to become a mentor and an accomplished leader in you? Well, you grew up reading Harry Potter and a lot of the rings, I think now at your stage you can read that. Because I remember going to New Zealand and really seeing the Lord of the Rings village and it all is so good. But when we grew up, we grew up only reading Enid Blyton's. We grew up reading uh, a, a little bit, you know, when you grow older, the classics like Thomas Hardy, like, yes, of course, they do ignite your mind. They bring out the best aspect of humanity because you always have to visualize it with a very, very positive mind and uh, learn from the failures of the characters that are being portrayed in the books. So, yes, there is a lot of learning and that has helped me. I hope I have answered. 
Yes, definitely. Ma'am, I'm glad you mentioned authors like Jane Austen, Tom Hardy, and Shakespeare as well. So, ma'am, speaking of great minds, you mentioned a quote by Albert Einstein Imagination is more important than knowledge. So, in today's world, I think that us students and us youth, we always think of the world as black or white. How do you think we can expand that imagination to look at the world in a plethora of colors and a spectrum of colors instead of just plain black or plain white? Wonderful. I think you realized it rather early in life and I congratulate you for it. Thank you. Because you are so much of a gizmo week students today and more so after COVID, you've not had time to even explore the earth, which you will now since things are getting better. Yeah. Imagination plays a very important role. Like I keep telling everybody, you perceive through imagination. You may be working through your ideas. But if you don't have the imagination, like if I, if you remember, I mentioned in my book that there was a particular child who was asked to draw a refrigerator. If I ask you to draw, draw the refrigerator, you will make a lovely rectangle. But the child made a sudden, and uh, his friends jeered at him. And they said, that, listen, this is not the way you make a He says, what's wrong? He showed it to his art teacher. So the art teacher also felt a little, you know, see, I taught the children how to draw a rectangle and this boy is making a sudden. Well, I have to ask him, how are you going to convince me? So he says, what matters in the refrigerator is not the shape. What matters is how to put the machine in the right place with the little box of its shape. I think that sounds so amazing. So it was his imagination. So Einstein himself has worked through imagination. Even Thomas Edison, it was all through imagination. So I am sure this will also give you very simple things like starting an episode, listening to people, will also ignite your mind and get the best of the imagination out. You don't have to be a nerd. <laughs> You're already imagining. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I just truly agree with you. Science, art, nothing would be there without imagination. Um, ma'am, would you mind if I ask a follow-up on that answer? Sure. Uh, ma'am, so you mentioned how um, the students kind of uh, teased him for drawing a circle. So what would you tell students who are trying to think out of the box and society kind of brings them down, what would be your advice to them? Wonderful. You know what happens? We have got into that fixed notion, what is in the book is right. Okay? You are lucky, you are in a curriculum that allows you to think out of the box, which is called critical thinking. Right? Which is nursed by all your other faculties. Fine? Okay. Now, if anybody tries to let you down, don't get calmed down. You must always consider yourself as unique, as special. You say, there is something in me that I got noticed. I have got to prove it, why I have done it. I don't have to tell them that what I have done is wrong. And you say, well, fine, for the time being, you are right. But I have also something to think of the box, and one day you will get to know. Thank you so much, ma'am. So ideally, you're asking us to be scavengers for inspiration. On that note, uh, my next question is regarding uh, the modern era. In the modern age of uh, social media and uh, you know widespread uh, uh, publicizing of people's artworks and people's achievements, uh, people are suffering from dissatisfaction, and people um, you know get uh, intimidated by all the things that other people are exploiting on social media. How do you let those ideas and that creativity uh, not hinder your own confidence to work or to create? Because I have seen myself struggling in some cases when I've seen someone else already do something and, or, or, you know, or pursue an idea that I had. So how do I find that? Find that? I think I quite got you a little there. What you uh, was trying to say is some kind of a recognition for the work and uh, some kind of intellectual property being shared by uh, somebody else. Well, first and foremost, when you do something, do it for yourself. Okay? If I have to do a particular kind of painting, I don't have to follow anybody. I have to draw the inspiration. Right? And once you've drawn that inspiration, the inspiration in you takes the better. 
of you to become a leader in becoming independent in what you want to do. And finally, maybe you will be rejected the first time or the second time somebody will do it. But what is yours belongs to you. Believe me, it will never stay away from you unless you let it go away. And you will let it go away when you just let somebody take it away from you. So like authenticity over originality? Yes. You got it? Okay, ma'am, uh, time and time again, you have encouraged us to be ambitious in a mirror of different ways. Uh, right from imagination to inventiveness, innovativeness, and even inspiring. Um, and you ask us to have lofty goals. In your experience, how lofty is too lofty? You see, lofty goals means not high-end goals, just keeping building castles in the air. You need to have certain short-term goals, long-term goals. What are your short-term goals? And these short-term goals should lead to your long-term goals. Okay? A simple thing, like my goal is now to have this program being done in the way you want it, the way you're perceived it. What is my long-term goal? My long-term goal is to move ahead and beyond this once I have achieved it. So in life, you will come across various small little projects, small little events that's going to shape you and this is going to take you far ahead when your goals are very clear, your ideas are crystal clear and you know exactly how your passion is driving it. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. That basically means that baby steps are better than stopping and small things matter. <laughs> so, excellent. <laughs> So ma'am, coming to my question. So throughout the book, we see you trying to make the juxtaposed ideas that coexist, whether the team makes the leader or the leader makes the team. So that's the value. So in your experience, how have you actualized the balance between these two diametrically opposing ideologies? Oh, wonderful. You know, it requires a little of both sides. It's a juxtapose. The very word means side by side, yeah. right? Now, sometimes when you become a leader, you have to lead, okay? You, you set examples and then you become a leader. But then a leader cannot just march ahead without looking behind and then you're like, no, no, no. You have to march along with them also. And sometimes the situation makes you a leader. That is where your inventiveness and innovativeness comes in, right? So it is a juxtapose. You are learning and you're imparting. And a leader becomes a leader once there's, there's no justification that you are a leader. You have become a leader because you're able to lead and you're able to have people, have uh, so many students or so many youth or basically my book is for all aspiring youth and uh, so many others also who love leading. In fact, I got a lot of them uh, talking, you know, who are uh, retired talking about my book. And that made me feel very happy, you know, they're retired soldiers, retired naval officers and officers. They said that I can think it's very nice that you have thought about it. So I said, well, I had to go through a very long journey before I could write. And probably if I was like you, my ideas would not have been this way. So it's, it is a juxtapose. You learn from one another. But a leader has to be a leader and will be the one who excludes me. So. That's a very wonderful answer. So thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, you, you used a great insurmountable amount of metaphors, allegories, and um, and even similes in your book, and anecdotes as well. So I wanted to know, is there anything that you thought was not fit for this book, and you edited it out of the book? You know what, you'll be very surprised the way I wrote the book. It's not that everything came in one go. First I decided the framework, and I said, okay, I'll start writing. And in fact, you'll be, you will be surprised to know that there were three ideas that came to me. I was writing three books, you know, different ways. So I said, how do I do it? And then I started writing this one, I started enjoying it because I was experiencing it also. Okay? Now the similes, the allegories, and the metaphors that have been used is to make it more comprehensible. You know, there should be some comprehensibility with a good language, reasonably good language, because, you know, that will help you to understand how a book is also written. So I basically use them not because uh, I want to be too wordy or make it you know, like a wordsmith. Definitely the idea was not to be a wordsmith.
but to be pick and choose and put it in the right frame. Um, that's really ambitious of you to try writing three books at one time. No, you know, you get three ideas <laughs> and then you put all of them together okay. and then you do it. That's yeah. how it happens. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, actually, I was curious about a topic over well, one of the chapters called industriousness. Now, uh, when I, whenever I'm in a position where I have to lead, uh, I have a tendency to uh, take out too much work and uh, you know not delegate enough, uh, you know, because there is this old adage that says if you want something to be done right, do it yourself. How do you draw the balance between delegating work and doing the work yourself as a leader? You know, I tell you, my greatest strength is hard work. There's no substitute to industriousness. And if you see the lives of great people, they have all been very hard working. Now, hard working doesn't mean you have to just keep working from morning till night. You have to work smart. You have to work intelligently. You have to prioritize your work. You must know what is to be delegated, what is not to be delegated. Initially, I made mistakes. I did not know what is to be delegated, and I thought, like you said, writing, that you have to do it yourself if you want it all right. But when I started delegating, I gave a little bit of leeway for mistakes when I considered myself capable or able to correct those mistakes. And in the bargain, you as a leader, you have taught somebody, made somebody learn, because a leader creates leaders, and unless you delegate, you cannot do it. Important work would require, that is called your prioritize. That's why I give you four strategies and tricks, if you have seen what should be prioritized, what should not be prioritized. Now today you've invited me, I did, I prioritized this. So you will wonder why I haven't given it that much of importance? That is because, not because my book is important, that is because you are important as you are going to start a new series. And this is your dream, and it is for me to see that I facilitated and I conceptualized it for you. That's perfect, Ram. Ram, so um, of course we're in a much more modern world, and the disparity between men and women has uh, been lower significantly. However, some patriarchal values still exist. And um, you have been a very accomplished uh, woman and you have, uh, like of course, been the principal of multiple schools. Um, but did you ever come across people telling you not to write this book and going against your ambition to write it? No, I, I haven't come across anything and I've been the principal of this school. But yes, I've had a large teaching experience back in India. And the gender equality is a question, but I think you are very lucky, Saisha, that you are in a country like India. And I think Indian women actually enjoy maximum freedom. Right from our basic age, you had uh, uh, Gandhi, you had uh, even in the Mahabharatas, you find women played a very important role. That's why we worship you know, Goddess Saraswati, we worship Lakshmi. Isn't it? So that is, of course, besides the point. But yes, there are people who have faced problems where they were not able to express their thoughts. As long as your thoughts are good for the society, good for the future, I am sure it will be welcomed. But I have not encountered anyone. My family has been very, very supportive. That's very great, Anya. We're so glad. Okay, now we come on to the imagination part. So now, if you were to be the high school you, what advice would you have given it to her so that it would have been beneficial for her at that time? So you want me to uh, impersonate as a high school student and talk to a friend or just as a principal, what would I speak to? Now, like if you could like meet your younger self. Yeah, so yeah, you meet your younger self, what advice would you give yeah. yourself to perhaps improve yourself or to maybe yeah. change something in your life? Passion, power, play. Oh. Just be passionate. Whatever you want to do, you do. We do some very silly things also sometimes. You know, and if we really have to share all this chat show, it will become a humorous show. <laughs> but we do a lot of it. So I think it is the passion that you should never let it. You should let it follow your heart. You know, you follow your heart, and then you automatically follow your mind. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Could I ask a follow-up on that? Yeah. 
But sometimes I notice my heart appeals to a lot of things, a plethora of things. I one day I might want to do tennis, the next basketball, the next I want to be a doctor. So how do you advise us, our students, to choose the right thing for us, to know that this is something that I'm truly passionate about. I want to pursue this in life. Okay, yes, you should dabble with everything. Otherwise, how will you know? Of course. What's good and what's not good for you? And you know, a very simple thing, maybe you will have a good friend who's good at tennis and then you find that, uh, well, I'm good at everything, maybe that little friend of mine, the peer group, will make me excel in tennis and you go ahead. Or you have been, that's why I've also spoken about inspirations. You, you like tennis, football, and maybe you like Maradona, and you say, okay, I'll go into soccer. Right? So inspiration, intuition, you have to work on it. And of course, being very young, you cannot. You will need guidance. And you also need that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, not support, but also the opportunities. So grab the opportunity when you have dabbled with everything. Find that the one hour moment that you have, which I mentioned in the book, yeah. will be the right one. Um, so yeah, bringing my uh, you know <laughs> my set of questions full circle from where we began. Like I said, we are very uh, fortuitous to be here, to be in this position, uh, to ask you questions, to get insights from you. Um, but you know, for all the people who will be reading your book in the future, uh, probably online or probably physically, um, how do you uh, expect or how do you plan on fielding their questions or interacting with your audience? That's a good question. In fact, I was thinking about it that probably I will have it put on my blog and then I will leave a mail ID and uh, now I don't get that kind of time. But then of course create a small little, uh, you know, uh, blog for myself only for my book and get all the questions answered. Sure, we will plug your blog in yeah. post. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so I actually have a question about the book cover that we can see on the screen as well. I want to know how you chose to design this and the color scheme because I felt it was so bright and wonderful and I just want to know what was the idea behind the book cover. You know what, the book cover speaks a lot about the book. And uh, why I chose these vibrant colors is I am a positive human being and I want vibrancy in my book because if you of course, it depends on each one's taste and choice. If you make it a little vibrant and you put in all the right colors, then there is a uh, motivation to read the book. And that was probably one of the ideas. But otherwise, I haven't thought of some great deep inner meaning. Because, you know, I know that I don't have to waste my time for great meanings. It has to move as a flow and it has to move as a cover with a little bit of artistic design. So it was the artistic skill in me or probably the instinct in me that made me do it. I just, that's it. That's I say. Um, Mark, actually one of the questions is kind of a follow-up or an extension to an answer you gave. So um, we, as students, we've always seen you be so cheerful and joyful around us. So we wanted to know what was your mantra for positivity? My mantra of positivity in life is that there are going to be a lot of moments when you, even I also have my share of grief and joy and all, but let the grief not crumble you. And that very often, that is very easy. Let the joy overtake you. And when you spread that cheer and joy with others, there will be the room is filled with positivity. So like a good balance of optimistic and pragmatic, I believe, as you say. <laughs> so, uh, okay. 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 So, uh, actually, the book was my question, but yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 uh, so my question to you is, ma'am, has it ever happened to your uh, experience or your course that you were capable of leading the team, but you didn't get the opportunity for it? Many times. Many times. You know what happens at workplace, you, I will not name the school where I was working or a place where I was working where they did not, you know, want to give me a kind of role I wanted. Not like say as students or as teachers, you like to be in the theatre club and you say, okay, I'm going to leave that. 
or you want to be the music club and you want to leave that. And then you're not given that. That I try to analyze. That's why I believe observation, experience, that leads to an analytical mind. I analyze myself, I cannot blame the other person. I always said that when you're doing it, I won't say it's vengeance, because by start, you know, taking into account, oh, you don't like me, that's why you've not done this, oh, you like that one or not. I'm only ruining my peace. I'm not ruining the other person's peace. So I analyze that why is it the other person taken and not me, and probably I have to correct myself. It could be for any number of reasons. And the moment you realize that this is the lacuna, this is the gap, I try to close the gap. And if I find that yes, I was right, but you were wrong, I try to let it go away. And I said, well, the next time I prove myself, I'll come closer. And I did that. Oh, that satisfies me. Thank you so much. <laughs> I feel like we found another by introspective. <laughs> You're right. I think I could, but I love the number 11. So I put only my super 11, like a pretty thing. <laughs> I wanted to add on something about your book cover. So if you see here, it does, doesn't it look like a rising sun to you? Yes. The rising sun of leadership. You're, this is basically you're guiding the minds. You're guiding minds to become leaders. You're telling them to rise. You're making youth rise. So is that something you went for as well? I think at the moment I would go with you because if you see the book, yes, it has the dawn and the dusk. Of course. Right? The two parts of the day. Twilight. The most important, the twilight. Okay? And then you see the mountain and the hill rising. Yes. Okay? So yes, it is the pinnacle of glory that one should look at. It's a wonderful yeah. distinction between foreground and background. <laughs> Your foreground is the rise, the you know, climbing that mountain or the surmounting the insurmountable and having scaling the mountain. Scaling, scaling the mountain. The mountain. And having this wonderful uh, fruit which is the beautiful sunrise at the end of it. Fruit of your the labors. Wonderful. See, I've let you imagine now. Yeah, yes, I probably it does not have thought so much about it. I only thought of one side and you brought out the multi passage side. Being <laughs> imaginative now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you would. It does signify the opportunity as well. Every day is a new day for you. And, exactly. uh, huh? and obviously, uh, you, obviously <laughs> you don't have to keep stop. You have to keep going because the sun will not stop for anybody. Excellent. I think I loved it because I always tell myself no two days alike. Ma'am, so now we have some eager and burning questions from grades 10, IBDP 1 and 2. Would you be willing to answer them for us? Sure, with pleasure. Sure. So first of all, we have Ishan from grade 12. Are there any books or authors that inspired you to become an author? Yes, of course. There have been a number of books and authors that have also inspired me. Otherwise, one doesn't dream of just writing a book. And uh, I have read books right from Diary of Bad Frank, right up to the latest one, which is uh, Education. And there is another book which I started reading, that is Yuval uh, Harari's. That, uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, called the Homo Sapiens, right. Right. Okay, the wise bed. And uh, there were some other books, the brief, the brief history of time. Oh, yes. And I'm very fond of autobiographies as well. Um, would, you, would you say you prefer fiction or non-fiction? Fiction, yes, but I prefer a lot of non-fiction. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, next question. Next. How did you balance your time between being the principal of three renowned schools and writing this book? Well, I think this is a question most of you were asking and even my teachers were asking me that you're all the time in school and how did you write a book? When did you get time? So I said, listen, whenever I, before I go to sleep, I have a pen, a paper and a diary next to my bedside where I jot all of my thoughts. I just had to bring them together. Uh, Ma'am, Ma being a true leader knows how to manage time. So oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh. All the chapters in your book begin with the letter I. What exactly prompted you to go with this approach? Wonderful. I think he wants to know why I have chosen the letter I. Yes. Like I told you, it is always denoted as, you know, you don't see I me myself. Okay? You always say that Nisha and I, Nishka and I, isn't it? Well, that's very respectful way of saying. But why should we degrade the I? Because in the I, 
put on the ice on the grid. So I took the time because I wanted you to identify yourself with all the various skills that you have through the letter I. That's very so, uh, you know, in essence, we could say that no one is ever truly doing something selfless. Like, a selfless act would connote, like, you doing something for someone else, which you yourself do not enjoy. Which, you know, takes out all the uh, purpose of charity, all the heartwarming purposes of charity. So, even charity is selfish, because it brings joy to you, it brings you that satisfaction that you've done something good. So, I feel it is very much okay to be selfish. The battle of no, why do you call it selfish? The, the trouble is, we say I is ill. I is not ill. When you are doing something good, and you are sure it's good, it's not a sadistic pleasure. Right. Yeah. It is a good pleasure that reverberates, that echoes. You're not only helping yourself, you're helping others. You're yourself. helping others. So if you make yourself happy, you're making four others happy as well. Yes, yeah. The one who is not happy will be doused by his own fire. <laughs> Coin, just the way you look at it, right? Right. Altruistic egoism or egoistic altruism, either way. Right. You can debate on it. You can ask some more. Yes. Fair, fair. Oh. Uh, Ma'am, now we have Kwai Shdave from Great 10 with her question. Curious as we are, would you be willing to uh, have share with us some of your future ideas for a book? A small sneak peek will do. Late in life, I have written a book and it's been my main adventure. And uh, today you find all youngsters coming out very quickly with books. Well, it's okay, it's nice, it's healthy, it to be very creative. But then when I wrote this, at least it has been based on a lot of experiences. And this main adventure will now not take me more time to come up with a second book. And already my thoughts are working hard towards it. So if all goes fine, you may see another one in 2022. I'm looking forward to interviewing you about that. Yes. Sure, and you'll be my first <laughs> exactly. favorite panelist. Oh. Well, thank, you. thank you for the opportunity. Ma'am, these anecdotes, methods have opened our eyes to see the world in its beautiful spectrum of colors. This has connected my mind, and I'm sure all of your minds, to nature and to the tactics and methods and nuances of becoming a sanguine and successful leader. Ma'am, we're truly motivated and enlightened by you. And now we've gained the tools and insights to cultivate the better leader within all of us. Before we leave, I'd like to request you to sign our copies of your book, perhaps with a personalized comment. Would you be willing to do that for us now? Sure, why not? It's sure. all for you. I dedicate it to you. Thank you and so all much. And all of you, my young minds. So before we move on to signing our books, uh, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for your dedicated answers on your work. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who is part of this team. Varsha Map, who has been an amazing guide and helping us organize this entire event. The IT team from HFS, Ishan, who has been working behind the camera the whole time. And of course, Nishka, Vidya, myself, and Himal, uh, for all being here today as well. Thank you everyone for joining us on the first episode of Insightful Leads. The first episode of many more to come, of many more leaders and many more minds. Thank you everyone. Have a good day. Thank you so much. What is the pleasure being here.